Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing type 1 activation of endothelial cells. Okay, so what we've seen so far is that when histamine binds to the H1 receptor on the surface of the endothelial cells, this will lead to a downstream pathway that overall leads to the production of prostacyclin or prostaglandin I2. And this prostaglandin I2 is then going to be secreted from the endothelial cells, okay? And it's going to be secreted from all three types of, well, the endothelial cells on all three types of blood vessel. So it's going to be secreted by the endothelial cells of the venules here, the endothelial cells of the capillaries, and also the endothelial cells of the arteriole. So remember in our tissue where the Staphylococcus aureus is, we have these three types of blood vessels arterioles leading to capillaries which then lead to venules. Now activation is going to occur on all of these um, and the, of the, well on, in the endothelial cells of all of three types of blood vessel in response to the histamine being released by um, the mast cells. Okay, uh, but where is it actually going to have effect? Well, that's going to be on the arterioles, basically, because only the arterioles have a smooth muscle cell uh, layer surrounding the inner layers of the blood vessel wall. Okay, so what will happen is prostacyclin will cause relaxation of the smooth muscle surrounding these arterioles. Okay, and that will mean that the circumference of these rings of smooth muscle cells becomes greater and that will lead to the dilatation of uh, the lumen of the blood vessel. So prostacyclin is going to cause vasodilatation of these arterioles. Okay, now when they vasodilatate, uh, then uh, that will allow more blood to flow through them into these capillaries. So you're going to increase the blood supply to this affected area of tissue, to this tissue that has the Staphylococcus aureus uh, infecting it. Okay, now this is what leads to the rubor and the calor of the five pillars of inflammation. So rubor, remember, means redness and calor means heat. So basically, in the area that's going to undergo the inflammatory response, you're going to get redness and heat, and that's because all of the arterioles leading to this area, to this affected area, are going to dilatate and allow an increased blood flow to that area. So you're going to get more blood in that area, and that's going to lead to that area appearing redder than the uh, normal um, area, well, the, the normal area would, and it's also going to lead to it um, becoming hot because blood is a very warm fluid. So uh, it's going to lead to heat as well, calor. Okay, so you also have another mechanism for inducing vasodilatation. So prostacyclin is one of the mechanisms by which uh, activated endothelial cells, type 1 activated endothelial cells, are going to induce um, relaxation of these smooth muscle cells. But there is actually another mechanism, and this will also be induced by the um, GQ pathway. So we've discussed that when um, the histamine binds to the H1 receptor, Okay, I'll just get the pathway back up, so where is it? Here it is. Um, no, not there it is. Here it is. So when histamine binds to the H1 receptor, it's going to activate our G protein and get this alpha Q uh, GTP complex here, which will activate phospholipase C beta, and phospholipase C beta then breaks down phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate into diacylglyceride and IP3. IP3 then acts on the IP3 receptors in the endoplasmic reticulum to cause release of calcium from the ER, and that calcium then goes on to activate the cellular phospholipase A2, and that leads to the production of the uh, prostaglandin I2. However, the calcium rise also acts for another mechanism, which we'll discuss now. Okay, so calcium, when it rises, is going to bind to a protein known as calmodulin. Okay, and I'm going to give a little bit of a discussion of calmodulin, because calmodulin is a protein that many people have heard of, but very few people actually know what it is or know anything about it. So calmodulin then. Calmodulin has two lobes, so I'll show it like this, with a linker in between them, okay? And one of the lobes is known as the N lobe, okay? And the other lobe is known as the C lobe. And these two lobes of calmodulin 
both have two calcium binding sites. So the N lobe has two binding sites for calcium, shown here by these two circles, and the C lobe also has two binding sites for calcium. Okay, and these binding sites for calcium are what are known as EF hand domains. And I want to just explain to you what an EF hand domain is. So an EF hand domain is a structure within a protein, or it's a polypeptide structure which is capable of binding calcium. Okay, and its general structure looks something like this. So if this line represents the polypeptide, it represents the polymer of amino acid after amino acid after amino acid, etc. Then the polypeptide folds into this sort of loop here. Okay, and this loop the actual amino acids within this loop, so if I demarcate these amino acids, so here is an amino acid followed by another amino acid followed by another amino acid, etc. The amino acids that are within this loop are all amino acids which have acidic R groups. And let me explain to you why this is going to help uh, them to coordinate a calcium ion. So, for instance, if I give you an example of an acidic amino acid, then Let's take aspartic acid. So here's the amino group of the amino acid. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the carboxylic acid group here. Now if we take, for example, the amino acid aspartic acid, then the R group in the case of aspartic acid is a methylene group followed by a carboxylic acid group. Okay. Now this is an acidic R group because this carboxylic acid group here is capable of donating a proton. Basically, the proton can leave that oxygen, leaving the oxygen with a negative charge. Let me draw what it's going to become. It's, this carboxylic acid group is going to turn into this group here, where the oxygen has a negative charge and the proton has been donated away. Okay, now, basically, um, Aspartic acid is the name for the molecule when it still has the proton attached to that alcohol group. So it's the name for the protonated molecule. When the proton has left the oxygen, and the oxygen now has a negative charge, this is instead known as aspartate. So the molecule, once it has lost its proton on that carboxylic acid group, is known as aspartate. Aspartate is also what's known as the conjugate base of aspartic acid. So that's the strict difference between aspartic acid and aspartate. Okay, uh, aspartate is strictly the conjugate base of aspartic acid. Okay, so aspartate is not an acid anymore. Instead, it's a base. It's the conjugate base of aspartic acid, and it's a base because it can't any more donate a proton away. Instead, aspartate is capable of receiving a proton, and the definition of something that receives a proton is to call it a base, basically. That's the definition of a base. Okay, so that's why aspartate is known as the conjugate base of aspartic acid. Now, if you have an aspartic acid molecule, it will continually be flipping between being actually in the aspartic acid state, where it has the proton bound to it, and then being in the aspartate state where it's lost its proton. So it continually uh, flip between the two states. One moment it will have the proton, then it will donate it away and it will be protonless. Then it will get a proton back again and it will be protonated again. Okay, so if we put a lot of acidic residues in this loop, okay, then, well, they all ha obey this general principle that if they donate their proton away, they can become a conjugate base which will be negatively charged. So if we put loads of acidic residues all the way around here, then at any one time, some of them will have donated their protons away and will have negative charge. Okay, Some of them will still be in the acidic state, but uh, or the protonated state, but some of them will have donated their protons away. So you'll have a bunch of negatively charged R groups facing into the centre of this loop. And that's ideal for coordinating a calcium ion, which is a divalent cation in the middle there. Okay, so that's what an EF hand domain is. Now, you very rarely find EF hand domains in proteins on their own. Instead, they usually come in dimers. So usually what you find is that you have 
one EF hand domain, let's say here, and then next to it, you'll have another EF hand domain here. And this is what's known as an EF dimer. Okay, so when you've got two EF hand domains sitting next to each other, that's known as an EF dimer. And this sort of a structure is what you've got in Calmodulin's two lobes. You've got one EF dimer in the N lobe and one EF dimer in the C lobe. And these are the two calcium binding sites, so they sit next to each other basically. So you have one EF dimer in the N lobe, so two calciums combined, one to each of these loops. And then you have another EF dimer in the C lobe. And again, two calciums combined, one to each of the loops. So you have two calcium binding sites. And that orange has really smudged that to a horrible, mucky colour. Right, okay, so, uh, when calmodulin doesn't have any calcium bound to it, it's in this sort of hunched over uh, conformation. The linker is sort of hunched over and the two lobes are sort of bent back towards one another. And this molecule is known strictly as APO, calmodulin, okay? And people will often abbreviate apocalmodulin to apo, and then they'll put capital C, lowercase a, capital M, and this is the abbreviation for calmodulin, okay? Now, when four calcium ions bind to those four calcium binding sites of an apocalmodulin molecule, what happens is that the uh, structure of this protein changes. So it sort of bends back out, the two lobes move outwards. So we've got the two lobes now not so hunched over basically, spread out away from one another. But then the kind of opposite thing happens to this linker in between. Before, although this linker was hunched over like this, it was a linear polypeptide, so you had amino acid after amino acid after amino acid after amino acid. Now, this linker forms an alpha helical structure, okay? So the, um, the amide groups, basically, are interacting with each other via hydrogen bonds, and it forms this secondary uh, protein structure known as an alpha helix. Okay, so this is an alpha helix. Whereas before it was literally just linear, you had an amino acid after an amino acid after amino acid, the thing was just like straight, even though it was hunched over. But now it's actually curved up like a spring, basically. And this is once calcium has bound to these four calcium binding sites. So I'll put some orange dots, or orangey black dots, as they'll turn out, in these sites. Oh dear, look at that. Those are just almost black now. Right, so this represents the calcium having bound to that calmodulin. And once you've got calcium bound to the calmodulin, this structure now is known as a calcium calmodulin complex. Okay? And for short, this is often denoted CA2, and then we use the abbreviation for CAM again. So this is calcium, and then CAM like that for calmodulin. Okay, right, so that's just a little uh, deviance into uh, calmodulin structure, just so that uh, anyone who doesn't know much about calmodulin now does know something about calmodulin. Let's now see what calcium calmodulin complexes are going to form, or what they're going to do. Right, so, when the calcium goes up due to the histamine having stimulated our endothelial cell, or of course we said long ago that, you know, it could have been more general than histamine. There are many pro-inflammatory uh, molecules capable of doing this. It will bind to calmodulin, and you'll get these calcium calmodulin complexes. So here's our calcium calmodulin complex with this alpha helix now linking the two lobes of calmodulin. Okay, and we've got four calciums bound to this calmodulin, and I think I'll do it with a different colour rather than orange to avoid that horrible smudge. Okay, so there we have our calcium calmodulin complex. So what is this calcium calmodulin complex going to activate within our endothelial cell? Well, basically, it's going to activate um, ENOS. Okay, so there is an enzyme within our endothelial cell known as the endothelium endothelial rather, nitric oxide synthase. Okay, so this stands for endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Okay, 
away, and this enzyme does what it says on the tin. It's going to produce nitric oxide, the free radical nitric oxide. And by the way, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, or ENOS, is also often written, um, it's also often called NOS free, nitric oxide synthase free. And in fact, nitric oxide synthase free is the more correct name uh, for ENOS. The reason being uh, that uh, ENOS is actually expressed in loads of tissues other than just endothelial cells. It was originally found in endothelial cells, which is why it was called endothelial nitric oxide synthase, but it's actually found in a huge number of other places. Uh, so it's more correctly now called nitric oxide synthase 3. Okay, now, once this enzyme has been activated within our endothelial cells, it's going to start chucking out nitric oxide, okay? So if we draw our endothelial cell here again, when the calcium went up in the cytoplasm, it's caused the formation of calcium camaldulin complexes within the cytoplasm, and now we're going to get the activation of this NOS free enzyme. So let's have our NOS free here, and usually it's attached to the membrane of the cell. Okay, so this is NOS free, and it's going to start producing nitric oxide. Okay, often abbreviated to NO. Okay, and nitric oxide, just to tell you what the structure of it is, here's the nitrogen. It's nitrogen double bonded to oxygen. Now that means the oxygen is perfectly happy, but the nitrogen still has one free lone electron. So this means that this molecule is actually a free radical. Okay, it's not a particularly dangerous free radical. There are far more reactive free radicals in the world than nitric oxide, uh, but it is still a free radical. Okay, so basically what's going to happen is when you activate these endothelial cells, they are all going to start producing nitric oxide, okay? So again, in all three types of blood vessel, the uh, arterioles, the capillaries, and the venules, the endothelial cells are going to start producing nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, too, is going to have a vasorelaxant uh, effect. So it's going to cause relaxation of the smooth muscle cells. So we've already seen that we produce prostacyclin, the nitric oxide is also going to synergize the prostacyclin. They're going to work together to produce a very good relaxation of the smooth muscle cells around these arterioles, okay? And when the smooth muscle cells relax, they become longer, which means that the circumference of this entire ring goes up, okay? And that means the diameter of the ring goes up, so everything goes from being like this to being like this, and that means that more blood can flow through these arterioles that are supplying this affected area, which means you're going to get more blood flowing through the capillaries and then the venules. So you get more blood supply to the affected area. And again, that's going to cause rubor and calor of the uh, five pillars of inflammation. Okay, so those are two effects of uh, activation of type 1 endothelial cell. Sorry of type 1 activation of endothelial cells, which are aimed at producing vasodilatation. Overall, the endothelial cells start producing prostacyclin and nitric oxide, and these cause vasodilatation. Okay, so we're now going to move on to how you actually get the endothelial cells to contract to increase the size of the gaps between neighbouring endothelial cells and make the capillaries more leaky so that proteins within the blood plasma, such as the complement proteins, can get out and fight this Staphylococcus aureus. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.